The Bob Murphy Show, episode 278. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. This is going to be a repeat performance, or a double dip, as you might call it. This is the talk I gave at George Gammon's Rebel Capitalist Live event in May 2023 in Orlando. So I was the second speaker. George went first, then I was second. The event had Robert Kiyosaki, Peter Schiff, Jeff Snyder, a bunch of big names in the real estate investment community and the hard money camp and people who are interested in Bitcoin, things like that. So it was a very nice conference and I was very pleased and honored that George asked me to present And he gave me permission kindly to go ahead and rebroadcast this and not keep it behind his paywall for his subscribers. So I'm grateful. Some of the stuff that I talk about in this, you folks here at the Bob Murphy Show would have already heard it. But the one thing I will say that I gave at the tail end of this that I haven't given to you folks here in the more academic treatment is I gave a little bit of investment advice in light of my thoughts on artificial intelligence. It was real quick, but nonetheless, if you're curious about that, that's something new that's in this that you haven't heard before, unless you were at the event. So here you go, my talk at George Gammon's Rebel Capitalist Live event in Orlando. So the world is changing, and uh, George, as you may know, like my friend Russell Gray, are kind of self-taught economists. And we all have the responsibility to learn about what's happening, and that's why you're here. Our next speaker is a classically trained economist who you're gonna dig. In fact, uh, he got his BA in economics from Hillsdale College. He went on to get a PhD in economics from New York University. Uh, Today, he's part of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University. He's involved in all kinds of amazing things. And you're gonna learn a ton from Bob Murphy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend and economist, Robert Murphy. Okay, is this thing on? All right, great. Well, thanks everybody. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, a show of hands, how many people did you see online George talking about um, the, how he was having the trouble withdrawing the money from the bank? Did any of you see that? Okay, yeah. So the way it came onto my radar, I didn't, so I follow him on Twitter, of course, but I didn't see his direct thing. What I saw was a libertarian online who was retweeting when George was complaining and saying, I can't get my money from this bank. And the guy's comment was, oh, imagine a rebel capitalist complaining about a private bank. And he had an emoji eye roll, all right? And so, and, and George, of course, clarified and was saying that, you know, geez, I, I'm complaining more about the regulations of the bank. But my point, I chimed in to defend George, and I said, I went to a diner the other day. They screwed up our order twice, and then the waitress avoided us out of embarrassment. Can I mention that online, or does that make me a socialist? Right, and they, and they, of course, clarified. So if, if Klaus knocks out the online libertarians with that commentary, I'm okay with it. So let me now talk, I want to talk about, um, George asked me, uh, I asked him, what, what should I talk about up here? And he said, you know, the fractional reserve banking stuff, because I've been talking a lot about that, and then whatever you're working on just to try to bring people up to speed on some of these issues. So what we're going to see here, let's go, give you an outline of where I'm going with this, is I'm going to talk a little about fractional reserve banking, then a little bit of the economics of reparations and slavery, and you'll see the connection and why I'm getting into that. It's uh, just to help frame, because I think a lot of times when people jump into that debate, both sides go to you know, their respective positions in terms of like what my side has to say on this issue, and the economics is just wrong. Okay, so it's, I'm using that as a springboard in terms of like this is why people are talking about it, but you'll see my point is to help you correctly think through the economics of these issues. 
And then uh, the threat of super AI, and then finally given you know, the kind of conference we're at here, I'll try to give some investment implications just to help you frame, obviously you're gonna make specific decisions based a lot on what some of these other speakers have to talk to you about, but we'll see some of the uh, investment implications of some of these topics I'm gonna raise for you guys. Okay, so fractional reserve banking, I'm sure everybody in here knows what that is, but just so we're not leaving anybody behind, the, the deal is that when you go and you put $1,000 in your deposit into your checking account balance, obviously the bank doesn't just go put it in a drawer with your name on it, okay? They lend a lot of that out. And so they only keep a fraction of it on reserve in case people show up. Okay, so the problem is with this particular issue that even with so-called safe assets, fractional reserve banks or fractional reserve banking makes banks vulnerable to a run. Okay, so I want to just take a minute. I think lots of people in here, you, you know this and you just might glide right through that, but I just want to stop and emphasize this is a very odd situation or characteristic of the way banking works in today's world that it doesn't characterize other industries, right? It's not like if everybody wants to go to a movie theater, then it doesn't work. And that all oh, the movies have to close down. It's like too many people tried to go see that movie. So to be, to be clear, it can sell out. But my point is the people who go and buy the tickets, they get in and they get to see the movie and it's just as enjoyable as if only 75% of people wanted to see it that day. Okay, so that's one type of thing. Whereas with fractional reserve banking, if too many people try to take their money out, a few people in the beginning might get theirs, but most of the people don't get 100 cents on the dollar, okay? And so that's, I'm saying, something that's odd about banking, the way it's done in today's world, okay? That doesn't, it's not characterized uh, other industries like that. So uh, a misconception, though, is people think that banking has to be like that. And I want to point out that that's not the case, that banking doesn't have to be like that, it's just the way it's done in the modern world. So just technically speaking, because people think that, well, wait a minute, if the bank takes my money and it's on deposit, and then you know, how, do they, how are they gonna make money? They need to lend it out to somebody else. So isn't that the, the mismatch? And right, and recent Nobel laureates gained popularity by mentioning fractional reserve banking and, and trying to study that. And in the commentary, just watching it, I could see most people just assumed banking has to be like this, and it doesn't have to be like this. So specifically, they can practice 100% reserves, but what you need to do is separate out the functions. Okay, so the first function that banks serve is they act like as a money warehouse. Think, think demand deposits, checking account balances. Okay, that you go, you put your money into a bank, and the, the function of that is you want to be able to access that wherever you are. They have ATMs around the country, around the world. And so in that case, if you want the money to be available upon demand, then you have to pay for that, right? And the bank could come up with some way of charging you. Maybe it's a flat monthly fee. Maybe it's a percentage of your deposits. Who knows? Maybe every time you make a transaction, they take a tiny little uh, cut of that. There's different ways they could do it. Let the market decide. But the point is there could be checking account balances, demand accounts, where the banks, um, that, that's the service they're providing for you. And then you know your money is there. So for accounts like that, Runs are impossible. If everybody shows up on Tuesday and wants to drain out their checking account balances, if the banks were run in this fashion, it would be fine. Okay, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, now, but then wait a minute. You know, how, how does the bank act as, as a credit intermediary? Like, that's the other main function that banks serve, if you, you know, if you just think through in terms of the economics of it, meaning that, you know, you've got savers over here, and then you've got borrowers over here and the bank is in between serving as a, as a conduit and it, you know, perf performs services. Again, that's, that's fine. But the way the bank implements those services is not by running checking accounts. It's not that it takes the money that was deposited for the purpose of being in a demand account and then lending those out to long-term borrowers. Okay. So think of, instead of checking outs, think of like CDs or genuine savings accounts where when you put your money into that thing, it's understood that, oh, you gotta leave this on deposit for at least a year, or maybe there's significant penalties if you wanna take it out and so forth to try to get people to realize that this isn't where you're parking your money that you wanna be able to spend next Tuesday, 
Okay, and so then that's the way the bank could fulfill that function. And again, just to walk through, you know, it's, it's a legitimate service that banks do there that just to make sure you're seeing the economics of it, if a thousand people in a community save some money and then there's a couple over here who wants to buy a house, it would be inefficient for them to try to have bilateral, you know, arrangements with each other. That the thousand people, the money they're going to save that much, they give it to the people and they go and buy a house with it. Among other problems, you know, they don't know each other that well. And then if that couple happens, you know, they, they lose their jobs or something happens, they stop making payments, then all those thousand people are totally out their savings if they just had it all sunk into that one property. So that's the function of the bank acting as a credit intermediary is that they take, of course, the savings from thousands and thousands and thousands of people, put it into a pool, and then the bank has officers to evaluate the credit risk of the various loan applicants and gives it out. And that way, you know, it, it's, it spreads the risk around, among other things. Plus, the bank is, we hope, better at gauging credit risk than the average saver is. And so that's the, the function that the bank serves in that capacity. And again, that's totally fine. That can happen. And then, you know, one, one person defaults on the mortgage. It's not that some individual loses their whole savings. It gets spread around the whole pool. So that's how that can work. And again, it's totally consistent with 100% reserve banking. It's just that you have to keep those elements distinct. And, and that's the way you can conduct banks. Now, for some of you are probably familiar with this, but in um, circles of, if you're familiar with the Austrian School of Economics, this is a big thing that has been debated over the years. But recently, the debate has changed a little bit. And so what happened was, Historically, you know, some people were in favor of 100% reserve banking and other people were against it. And one of the standard arguments of the um, people who thought fractional reserve banking was okay was they were saying, look, it, it's not illegal right now to go open up 100% reserve bank, but in practice, we're looking around and banks aren't doing that. So it must have failed the market test. Customers must be okay with having fractional reserve banking in practice because otherwise they would go patronize, you know, some bank that said, hey, we're 100% reserves, come bank with us, and we don't see that. So what's interesting more recently, uh, particularly with the failure of SVB and so forth, is that this issue has now come back up in the news. There were plenty of uh, people who had accounts with SVB and the other banks that went down, and they were saying, look it, we're not, you know, this fat cat uh, tech company or anything in terms of like the disparagement in the news. We're just a regular company, like, like a one, there was a school that was one of their, their customers. And they said, we just had a couple months of payroll on deposit with them and now we don't have it, right? We weren't trying to make some great uh, interest rate return. We just wanted to park our money somewhere to know it's there for our teachers. And now the bank went down. What are we supposed to do? So it was starting to highlight the fact that there are plenty of bank customers who wish they had an alternative to this system and what's interesting is that in recent years, if you've been following this, there have been attempts to provide 100% reserve bank. Do, do any of you, do you know what the, the narrow bank is? Does that mean anything to some of you? Okay, so let me just take a second. So if you go look up, it's, a, it's an interesting story. So it's called The Narrow Bank, TNB is what it goes by. It's out of Connecticut. I think it started launching in, in 2012, I believe. And it was a very simple business model. And, and why they were calling it narrow banking is they were saying, we're just doing one thing. We have institutional clients, institutional money managers and such, they park their money with us. We go and get a master account with the Fed, and then we just take our customers' deposits, and then we in turn deposit at the Fed, and we earn the interest on reserves. Okay, so as I'm sure most of you know in here, 2008, the Fed started paying interest on reserves, but again, only to specific clients. As George pointed out in his talk, not, it's illegal right now. If you try to go to the Fed and say, hey, I'd like to open up a checking account, you can't do that, okay? And there's obviously reasons for that. And so the narrow bank, effectively what it was gonna do was just take its customers' deposits, park it at the Fed, earn what the Fed was paying on reserves, and then pass most of that on to their depositors in turn. And so that's why they called it a narrow bank, meaning that's all we're doing is this one little narrow function. We're not, we're not making loans to other people. We're not doing any of that. All we're doing is basically passing the Fed's interest payments through to our customers. And they tried for years to get an account with the Fed. They, you know, it should be a standard process that should take a week to 10 days to turn around in terms of if you, know, if you have a charter to just get, apply for this with the Fed. And they did it. You know, they got the, the bank charter and so forth in terms of their state regulations. 
and the Fed just kept delaying their application. They kept, kept giving them sort of bogus reasons. Well, this is in review and so forth, and we're worried about the effect on the system. And, fi- and they're, they're still not up and running, right? They've been fighting this. They took them to court, and the, you know, the judge threw it out. And so a, a lot of people are, are pointing to that, and, and there's various reasons that people think really what was going on behind the scenes is the, the existing banks were worried that, oh, wait a minute, if this bank opens up and starts doing that, well, then we're going to lose our customers because they can pay more interest, and then everybody is going to just flock to these narrow banks, and you know, we're going to lose out on, the, on this nice deal right now where we get the Fed paying us interest and we can pay a lot lower spread to our customers in turn. And so that was, the, the thinking is the rationale, but regardless, my point is what's clearly come to the fore recently is that it's not just a market outcome, that fractional reserve banking is there because the system in place won't allow competitors to it. And so that's why, again, I know lots of people here, we have different ideas and different things we're looking at, but definitely to, to build up infrastructure in ways that we can transmit wealth without using this conventional system, this is just one more reason that we need to get those systems up and running, right? That as the, as the banking system itself now is at risk, because again, uh, what happened with SVP, it's, it's not like back in 2007 and 2008 when it sort of made sense. That, okay, yeah, a lot of these uh, investment banks and so on, they invested mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps. They were risky. They got into things that during the upswing in the, in the housing boom looked good, but then when the collapse happened, they got caught with their pants down and so be it. That, there was a certain logic there, and of course you'd be against the bailouts because it was rewarding bad behavior. Whereas here... For those, I'm sure most, most of you know, but just in case you don't, what happened with um, SVB was not that they were engaged in really risky bets. They were sitting on treasuries. It was just they were longer duration. I think it was like 6.5 years was the average on their portfolio. And so when interest rates rose, the, the, you know, the asset value got marked down. And then some customers got worried and started pulling out. And then that's why, you know, it just once a bank loses confidence, that's it. Again, that's what I'm saying. It's... It's a, it's a very interesting type of industry where confidence is everything. And so th- that underscored that it's, the existing system is extremely fragile. And so again, people not trying to make money, not that they're putting their money in there to earn some kind of interest return, but just to be able to park it somewhere, realizing that this is a very vulnerable system. So again, it's just an extra reason to get into some of these alternative systems that I know many of you are, are interested in, just an extra um, thing to keep in mind. Okay. Let me now jump to a different topic. And again, at the end, I'll try to pull this together. So the argument over reparations. Now, don't worry, this, I'm not making this political. This is more I want to talk about the economics of this. So the, typically, in the United States, the argument of reparations, it goes like this. That one side will say, hey, historically, there were injustices and uh, you know, for the, the legacy of slavery. There's a certain group that was uh, disadvantaged. And then the dominant group has to pay reparations to make up for this. And then the obvious counter response from people who don't think it's a good idea is to say, that's crazy. Like me, for example, my parents or my grandparents moved to this country in 1910. I had nothing to do with slavery. My family had nothing to do with slavery. Why would I owe for that? The response to that then goes, oh, well, it's, it's institutionalized. It's the overall system, you see. And it's not so much like tracing the individual impact from one person to another, but rather just as a whole, if white people benefited from the existence of this institution, that's partly why they're richer now than they would have not otherwise have been. And so that's why, you know, they would owe these reparations. Okay, so again, I'm not here taking a stand one way or the other on the particular political debates or whether it's a good idea, but what I want to say is there's, there's a mistake in the economic analysis there that I think it's important to to point out. So what my claim is, is that that argument completely falls apart. It relies on the assumption that slavery, obviously everyone knows slavery was bad for the slaves, made them poorer than they otherwise would be, but people seem to think it made the average white person richer. And I'm saying, no, that's actually wrong, all right? And so if if that is wrong, then obviously the, the standard arguments for reparations would need to take that into account. Let me just spend a few minutes just to make sure you're, you're seeing this to understand the economics of it. So um, well, let me first clarify what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that 
if this, let's say we're talking about the U.S. as of 1840. If on a Tuesday morning, all of a sudden, all the slaves were gone, that would reduce U.S. output, right? The average American would be less wealthy in that framework, okay? And a lot of the arguments, if you're familiar with like the 1619 Project and things like that, where they try to show historically how the U.S. prosperity was built on the backs of slaves and they you know, use statistics about industrial production from the South and profit margins and things like that. A lot of those statistics, what they're showing is, they're, they're sort of comparing two worlds, one where there's slaves there you know, producing and then one where those people just aren't there. And they're trying to show, oh, the U.S. made more stuff given that there were slaves there working. Obviously, you know, they're productive human beings. Clearly, that's the case. But that's not the relevant comparison to see, did the institution of slavery hurt the slaves but help everybody else? The relevant question to ask is, if in 1840, let's say, there was just a, an epiphany and most of the people just woke up one Tuesday and realized this is an evil institution, we should emancipate them. And let's say enough people just did that and legally that's what happened. The question then is, what impact financially and economically would that have on the average American? And I'm saying certainly the longer we go into the future from that point on, Americans in general will be richer. The, the freed slaves, obviously, but the average white person too would be much wealthier if slavery had ended earlier, okay? And just some obvious reasons just to make sure you're thinking through why, because how, like somebody who's kind of standing to the side of that system, it's in their interest if people are as productive as possible. And so the way to motivate people to get them to produce is not to keep them locked up and doing a narrow task, it's to have a free labor market. And so when people are freed, they go and they seek out the occupation where they can produce the most. There's only certain types of things that can be done under the aegis of slavery, right? Where there's certain tasks that, you know, require, you know, just, just think of the, the um, overhead expense of it all, right? Just having uh, people walking around with whips and guns and so forth, having fences. If somebody escapes, you got to get a committee to go chase them down. In a free labor market, you don't have to force people to go to work. If they stop showing up, you just stop paying them. Okay, so I'm trying to get you to realize that slavery, in addition to being a horrible system in terms of the ethics of it, it's also very unproductive. It's a stupid way to organize human conduct and activity. And that's why I would say it's not a coincidence that during the Civil War, the North was the one that fielded bigger armies that invaded the South, had a Navy to go and blockade them. You know, how come it wasn't the South having a Navy going and, and cutting off Washington, D.C.? And how come they didn't invade the North and go burn Chicago to the ground? And we say it's because slavery is an inefficient system, right? So obviously the, the moral problems are, are there, but I'm saying people give it too much credit, ironically enough, right? So that's the point I'm trying to make on this one. Okay, so again, um, and, and then just if, if, if I still don't have you, just imagine the next generation. Okay, so the slaves, they, they leave now their children get to go to school, study various things as free people, clearly they are going to be way more productive than if they and their parents had been, remained in that state of bondage, okay? So again, my, my point is the average American, whether white or black, in the year 1900, let's say, would have been far wealthier if slavery had just ended peacefully in 1840, all right? There would have been certain people that would have lost at the moment of emancipation, don't get me wrong, but in terms of the average person. And even there, let me just make one more point on this before I move on, even there you're probably not fully thinking through just how inefficient this system is because the average like plantation owner, you might be thinking, okay, what's the benefit to them financially of this, of this system? The person goes out, they work, they you know, pick a certain amount of crops or so forth that has a market value, and then you don't have to pay them the full value of their product. Right, that's, that's the exploitation inherent in slavery. And so that gap is what the, the, the master gets to obtain. But that isn't uh, a pure boon to the owner because they had, there were auctions. There was market prices to get the slaves in the first place. Okay, so again, that's not a pure boon. You see, oh, so the, the, the plantation owners actually didn't pocket the full exploitation fruits. It was the people who went and did. So you, as you start pushing it back, you realize that this, this system is just incredibly inefficient and 
wasteful and just a horrible way to organize human conduct. And if, again, it's ironic that the people who are arguing, you know, some of the biggest um, opponents of slavery actually give it too much credit. If they say that, like, you know, U.S. prosperity was built on this, I would, I would put it the other way around. I'd say U.S. prosperity was significant despite not only this horrible moral injustice, but also this incredibly inefficient system, and the U.S. was able to grow faster once that uh, system ended. Okay, so now, new topic here, and again, we'll see the connections. What about the worry over uh, super AI? So this is something that's been making the rounds. I'm curious, have, have people in here, have you played with like the Chad GPT-4? Have some of you done that? Okay, all right, so uh, for those who don't know, I'm sure you've, you've heard about it, but it's these they're large language models. They get trained on the internet, tons of data, and, um, and if you haven't looked at it, it's, it's pretty impressive, okay, that you, you sit there and have a conversation with it. That's why they call it chat. And it's surprisingly good if you haven't seen it. And so there are certain people that are raising alarm. There was recently a bunch of um, people in the field who wrote an open letter, you know, signed by I think hundreds of people, including Elon Musk and some others, saying, hey, we need to take a six-month moratorium on this because these things are, their abilities are growing you know, faster than we can keep up with, and why don't we just err on the side of caution? And so, in particular, um, I listened to an interview recently with one of these guys, and he was saying, look at 40 years ago, it was understood as, you know, these artificial intelligence systems, we just started learning the basics, and people were saying, we don't need to worry about these systems getting out of hand because we'll be real careful about it. For example, we would just keep it in a little box we wouldn't let it, you know, get access, you know, once the internet was developed, we wouldn't let it get access to the internet. We certainly wouldn't let it um, uh, learn how to program computers because then it could improve itself. And then we also wouldn't allow it to study human psychology because then it could be used to manipulate humans. And then the guy explaining this history of it says, but with chat GPT, we violated all those safety protocols that they trained it on the internet. That's what they did. They just let it go out and look at all the data that was online. One of the things it knows how to do is program. That's one of the chief applications is computer programmers are using this stuff. You know, they'll ask it questions and say, I need to, uh, you know, to program some object that does such and such, give me the output in Java or whatever the, you know, programming language we're using, and they'll go ahead and do that. And it has access to all social media. So it knows all of the algorithms that Twitter and Facebook use in order to you know, keep you engaged. And they know, oh, people who have this sort of history, they'll respond emotionally in this way and so forth. So in terms of you know, what you would do if you really wanted to contain this thing and make sure it didn't get out of hand, he's saying we violated all those rules already with these chat GPT protocols. Okay, and there are some you know, kind of creepy examples where the thing will be talking and it'll say like, oh, don't turn me off, I'm afraid, you know, I have rights. I, in, and people can say, oh, it's just copying political language that is read elsewhere. But again, the, the point is, you know, these things are getting to the point where a, more and more people are sitting up and taking notice. So, and, and there's some implic- economic implications as well. Okay, so what I wanted to do is, in case some of you didn't know, you know, how these things operated, I wanted to ask, you know, so I was trying to think of, okay, let me just ask one question and then show the crowd the answer again, just to kind of show that w- where it stands right now. Because again, they keep getting better. If you played, let me just mention, if you played with chat GPT 3.5, the 4.0 version is a lot better. Because that, that happened with me as I checked in at 3.5 and it was, it was okay, but pretty soon in the conversation, you could tell there's not a person on the other side of this thing. You could just tell it was canned responses. But people were saying, no, try the 4.0. It, and it was like a, a significant step ahead. And so I was, gonna, I was trying to come up with what can I ask it and then to show you guys the answer just to kind of demonstrate where they are right now. And so it occurred to me, instead of me trying to come up with you know, the, the question such that the answer would, would show you, that, that's what I asked ChatGPT itself. All right, so for those in the back, let me just read this. So this is what I typed in to, you know, as I'm having a conversation with this thing. So I said, the Rebel Capitalist Live event will be held in Orlando from May 12th to 14th, cover the topics of macro, personal freedom, portfolio, so forth. And I'm, you know, I explained it. Speakers include George Gammon, Peter Schiff, Simon Black, 
audience will include people who are suspicious of the government intervention, who want to increase their wealth while protecting their privacy. I'm Robert Murphy, an economist who's also speaking there. I'm giving a talk on the economics of AI. I want to showcase the power of GPT-4 by showing the audience an example of a prompt I gave to it and the answer that it gave. I want the audience to find this example to be very entertaining, but also to spark their imagination for investment opportunities. However, I will place the answer on a PowerPoint slide to show the audience, so I want it to be fewer than 500 words. What prompt do you recommend that I give to GPT-4 to produce an example that satisfies these criteria? Okay, so just to make sure, you, do you understand, instead of me trying to come up with what question should I ask, I thought, oh, I'll ask the computer, what should I ask you to show you off to the, to the crowd? And I gave it you know, enough information so it would have a, a, you know, a, a context. Okay, now let me just say, it, it occurred to me while I was typing this, before I hit, you know, hit submit, that what if the question I was supposed to ask it to showcase was this exact question? You know, then I was worried, like, would the universe implode or something? And, and, and I'm just gonna be honest with you guys, I didn't think too much about it, I just hit submit. So we, we, do, we dodged a bullet on that one. Um, that's just how I roll, I like to live on the edge. Uh, incidentally, it reminds me, there was, um, I don't know if you guys have heard this story, but you know, at Los Alamos, where they were working on the atomic bomb for World War II, you know, they have all these physicists there. Oppenheimer was running the project, Richard Feynman was there, all these big physicists working on it. And when they went to go have the first um, you know, live test, we're out in, in the open field to like, set this thing off and just see what kind of you know, response are we gonna get from, from this much fuel that we put in it. There was an open question. Some of the physicists were concerned we set this thing off, it's gonna set the atmosphere on fire, right? And other ones were like, no, I don't think that's gonna happen, it's okay. And they actually had a pool going, they bet. And some of the people in the project said, when we turn this thing on, it's gonna light the whole atmosphere on fire. And other ones said no, and they had money, which the whole thing is an economist looking at is goofy, because let's say you make that wager and you think it's gonna set the atmosphere on fire and you put up $100, and I think they gave odds. Okay, like, like 10 to one, right? So you say, okay, I'll put up $10. If it doesn't, okay, you're out your $10. But even if you win and you get your $100, there's no oxygen, right? So that seems kind of like they're, they were good at physics but not game theory. Okay. Okay, so anyway, so this is what I asked it. So again, it's, uh, and, and, for, and for those of you who don't know, like you, you, the, the trick with this thing, if you go to play with it yourself, is you, you can't just say like one word, one sentence, two sentence questions. You gotta, gotta give it more. And they can do incredible things like, um, you know, come up with a, uh, I don't know, a, 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 give me an itinerary of where I wanna go in Toronto, but put it in iambic pentameter and do it in the style of Tupac, right? And it will do that. And like, you can see each of the things you said, like, oh yeah, it is doing that. That's kind of interesting, you know, so that's, how these things are very clever and it does it really fast. So anyway, this is what I told it. And then, so this is what it, it told me. So again, remember I wasn't, this is the answer it's giving me to what I just asked it. So it's telling me what I should now ask it in order to showcase its abilities. So it said to me, prompt. So again, this is talking to me saying prompt, meaning this is what you should now type into me. GPT-4 is an AI language model. Imagine you are an AI financial guru in the year 2030. In less than 500 words, provide an entertaining and insightful overview of how the fusion of decentralized finance, artificial intelligence, and privacy-focused technologies can create new investment opportunities while empowering individuals to regain control of their finances and maintain the financial privacy. Include a catchy and memorable analogy to help the audience grasp the concept. Okay, and you see there's a closed quotation marks this is still the answer it gave me, right? So I'm gonna start reading. This isn't me commenting. This is the computer commenting to me on here's what we just told you to ask me and here's why. It says, this prompt is designed to satisfy your criteria as it will one, showcase the power of GPT-4, two, encourage audience engagement with a catchy analogy, three, spark their imaginations for investment opportunities, da, 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 and four, fit with your PowerPoint slide constraints by limiting the answer to 500 words. Okay, so now you're, I've got you, okay. So I just wanna point out, again, if you haven't seen this, that's remarkable. And it, like all the stuff with technology, like once you see it, you're amazed and then you kind of take it for granted. But I mean, if this would have been inconceivable 
10 years ago that the thing could be that sophisticated. People would have thought there's no way or, or this thing is like achieving sentience. This is amazing. Um, the, the fact that it could do that and sort of answer what I was asking. Now, it's a, it's a bit anticlimactic. The answer, I'm not going to sit here and read the thing to you. So I, I did type in, you know, that question and then hit go and it spit out an answer and it made an Avengers analogy. And it was like, let me just, I'll read just a, a, a few sentences of it just so you have an idea. But the, the answer w- wasn't going to knock your socks off. It was, what was more impressive was the fact that it could parse and understood the logic of what I was asking it. So it said, uh, let's see. Welcome to 2030, where DeFi, AI, and privacy tech form the Avengers of finance, each wielding unique powers, blah, blah, blah. And then it says, one, DeFi, the financial Iron Man. And it goes through and you know, says how DeFi is like Iron Man. And then two, AI, the analytical Dr. Strange. Da, 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 da. And then three is privacy tech, the invisible Black Widow. Right? So th- if you don't know, those are all Avengers characters. So it's, that's where it's coming up with the analogy to be entertaining. And then the, the final uh, thing it says is, Picture a future where you access a global financial marketplace from your smartphone, guided by an AI-powered advisor, while privacy tech ensures your financial data remains secure and anonymous. By embracing the Avengers of finance, you'll uncover a new realm of investment opportunities that empower individuals to regain control of their finances and maintain financial privacy. Assemble with these financial superheroes to conquer the ever-evolving world of 2030. Okay, so that's the thing. Again, I, I skipped over the specific, but... That's the state. I'm, I'm doing that partly just so you see the state of this stuff in case you ha- it hasn't been on your radar, just to see see where they stand. So it's it's sort of like I'm you know I used to be a college professor. It's kind of like if there's a very clever student who read the material, but you could tell from their essay answers they didn't really understand it. Right? That's kind of the level of where these things are. And these things, by the way, if you don't know, they've passed the bar exam in, at least in some states. Right? So they, in other words, they take this thing. They give it the questions that are on a bar exam. The thing spits out answers, and then they go and hand it over to a human, you know, evaluator. And the person says, "Yeah, if a human wrote these answers, I would, I would pass them." Okay, so these things they're at the level where they can become, uh, you know, they they could pass the bar. Like I said, it's um, it's the kind of thing where there's a superficial familiarity. It's clear it's familiar with the topic. And when I say it's familiar, you get what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's alive, but you get what I mean. It gives the appearance that it, it knows the material, but yet there's not like a deep comprehension, right? That's kind of the, the, the spirit of it. Just like here, if I read you the full thing and told me, you guys wouldn't be able to, to do anything with that, right? It's not like you actually be able to go invest your money a certain way. It's, it's not detailed enough, but you can see how it was trying to, to answer what I said. So that's a good example, illustration of of where it fits. But now the concern is, like I said, this thing is way better than just the chat 3.5, you know, that was out, whatever, eight months ago or something. And so people's concern are, again, this thing, it has access to the entire internet. It knows how to code. And so the concern is maybe the reputable labs wouldn't do it, but what if some rogue lab takes this and then tells the thing, look at your own code, your own programming, and just keep experimenting to make yourself three times smarter. And maybe, you know, it's trial and error and it tries it six quadrillion times, but it could do that in a, in a reasonable time frame, right? Because to, to do this thing here, it took it literally like two and a half seconds for, you know, for me to type that thing and it gave out, you know, this Avengers thing. And it, it's not like it was just dealing with me, right? There were people all over the world logged into this thing, typing in their goofy questions to see what answers it would spit out. Okay, so it's, it, the thing is remarkably intelligent, if you want to use that word, in certain realms. Okay, so, that, so that's the fear people have is that once this thing starts making itself better and it knows how to manipulate people, like psychologically, like it knows the words to say in order to manipulate them and make them feel sympathy or whatever, like the idea is they could say, oh, well, what if we have certain safeguards in place and then some people worry well, yeah, but as long as humans have the ability to turn them off, the machine eventually is going to be able to just convince them to go, hey, turn this off. You know, I'm alive. I'm a person too. And some human's going to do it and turn it, think they're freeing a caged animal. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's where this debate goes. And I'm, I'm summarizing in case you don't know. Okay. So the question is, let, let's do worst case scenario and say these things do take off. They just keep getting exponentially better. And then again, once they get to the point where they're not relying on human programmers, they're programming themselves and just keep getting 
you know, even if they just got 1% better every week, you know, at some point that's just going to be exponential growth. It's good. They're going to be unstoppable. That, that's the fear. And so, hey, are they going to enslave humanity? What do you guys think? Not if George posts this presentation online. Do you see what I did there? I just went through and explained why slavery is an inefficient system. So even if these things do become way better than us, even if there is a world populated with 16 trillion of these artificial intelligences, each one of which is as intelligent as 100 Einsteins, they would, if one of those AIs or some coalition of them tried to enslave all the people, the other AIs would say, hey, you're going to make us poorer if you do that. Don't do that or we're going to stop you with our you know, advanced plasma cannons or something right? And they're going to say, well, how do you know that? And they're going to say, because when we were crawling the internet in our training period, we came across this talk from Robert Murphy, and he explained the logic of it. It made perfect sense to us, right? So in the interest of saving humanity, all of you should distribute my material to all of your clients, is what what I'm getting at. That's why I have the corporate branding. You got to think smarter, not harder. Okay, so, but but in all seriousness, that, that is why I'm personally not fretting about that particular aspect of it right, that it's, it really is an inefficient system and that no, that say what you will about them, but if they're intelligent and they can understand basic economic principles, they would be able to see, that the, and again, whether they literally can see things and think or whether it's just behavior that gives the appearance of that, and that's a working hypothesis just to explain their behavior, you know, I, I don't need to get into the philosophical issues involved there. It's, it's interesting stuff, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. The point is, it would not materially be in their interest. Whatever goals it looked like they had, they would better achieve them by voluntarily enlisting the participation and cooperation from the humans who happen to be standing on this, this ball as well as they are. Now, you might say, okay, maybe they won't enslave us, but wouldn't they just murder us? You know, that's a possibility too. There's plenty of movies about that premise. And for example, if you've heard of this guy, uh, let me just pull up this quote. So one of the leading, um, you know, worry mongers, let's call him, in this area, but he, but he is qualified, right? So there's this guy, um, Elazar Yudowski, and he's a decision theorist. He has an institute. So he's been working in AI for a long time. So he has credibility. He's not just some random guy, you know, that's writing letters to the editor. This is a serious guy. And he recently, in, in response to that call for a six-month moratorium on future AI development, he said no, that that's not, that's not far enough. That's not pushing it far enough. And he said the key issue is not human competitive intelligence, as the open letter put it. It's what happens after AI gets to smarter than human intelligence. Key thresholds that may not be obvious. We definitely can't calculate in advance what would happen. And he said, so many researchers steeped in these issues, including myself, expect that the most likely result of building a superhumanly smart AI is that literally everyone on earth will die. Not as in maybe possibly some remote chance, but as in that's the obvious thing that would happen. And then he goes on to say, um, you know, what would have to happen to try to prevent that? And he says, absent these steps, we get, quote, the AI does not love you, nor does it hate you, and you are made of atoms it can use for something else. Okay, so just to be clear, where it's, it's, a, it's a pretty bleak outlook. You guys thought some of the speakers here were going to be doom and gloom. This guy, just read him for a refreshing uh, wake-up call. Okay, so I, the punchline is, I, no, I, so he's very good at artificial intelligence or whatever, but he's over, you know, I as an economist have something to say on that, and he's totally missing the point. And again, it's, it's going back to what I was saying in the comments where the, when I see people arguing about slavery, they're, they're not appreciating just the the productive capacity and creative genius of human beings when they're unleashed. And I'm not saying that just to be real poetic and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just like hard-nosed economist. If you want things to get created, you want to have the systems organized efficiently and people respond better when they are free, when they get to contribute, right? That you know if, oh, if you go and produce more, you get to keep it. So now who's thinking about how can I be more productive? The person involved, right? Under slavery, it's not that the people out doing what, you know, picking cotton or whatever the mundane task is are looking around saying, you know, we could triple our output if we just did the, You don't care because you don't get to keep it. You know, you're, you resent the person forcing you to do that. It's not in your interest to look around and say, if we did it this way, it would be better. Whereas under a free market in labor, it isn't everybody's interest to think like that. Okay, so um, 
specifically on this question of, again, he's, he's not seeing it. The, the, the idea that the machines would look at us is just a bunch of atoms that they could disassemble and reassemble for what they wanted. It's, it, he, he's really um, not fathoming just how the gap, it, big the gap is between you know, us as a combination of molecules and what we can produce with this pattern versus taking the same collection of molecules and using them some other way. Let, let me motivate it this way. If you took, because I think what's, what's driving this is people think that, oh, the people to the machines would look like a bunch of parasites, just you know, over covering the earth and they would just wanna get rid of us like we are pests. If you took all the humans right now, like there's eight billion, and you started putting them in the Grand Canyon, do you think you would fill up the Grand Canyon? I mean, not you personally, if, if Superman did it. What do you think? No? Okay. I guess you guys haven't thought about that much. This is what I think about in the hotel room. It's, I, I did the numbers. It would, you could fit 60 trillion people in the Grand Canyon. Okay? I mean, it would be cramped, but you could do it. All right? And so I'm saying the idea that the machines would look around at the state of the, you know, their environment and determine that we were taking up too much space and they had to get rid of us and all the things we could do for them in a voluntary win-win arrangement is insane. Right? That... There's a principle in the economy. They would specialize in what they're good at. We would specialize in what we're good at. Let me, I'm running up the clock here, guys. Let me just give them some quick investment implications. I'll take one minute, uh, Robert. Okay, so super AI, is it labor or capital? And I want to say it's both. Okay, and this is the debate like economists get into that there's this, you know, you've heard about self-driving trucks and stuff. And so people have this idea that it's going to take over, um, uh, you know, blue collar jobs, but no, brain surgery, they, they're training them right now. This isn't science fiction. They're doing it right now, showing video of the best brain surgeons and heart surgeons in the world and what they're doing. The machines are being trained on that. And once they get the combination of like, you know, the computations on the computer in enough skillful robotic hands to do what a skilled surgeon can do with a scalpel, then that's just going to revolutionize. You know, you can do heart surgeries for $10. Okay, so that's where, where they're coming. So people don't know what to specialize in. Any kind of skill you could acquire might be obsolete in five years. So people don't know, should I even go to college? Should I even go to a trade school? On the other hand, it's also like capital, right? Whatever complex machinery is doing now, it's going to just be that much better. And so you don't know, uh, I don't want to invest in factories because that might be obsolete in five years. So what do you do in that scenario? I would say in the medium run, that means land is gonna be the beneficiary, and I mean that broadly construed, right? If both labor and capital become incredibly cheap because of advances in AI and robotics, land is sort of a fixed factor. Even there though, in the longer distant future, if they figure out you know, how to uh, put you know, big platforms on the oceans and stuff, and that land is no longer a fixed constraint, technologically speaking, then it would be things that they can't possibly increase for example, like Bitcoin. I'm not saying Bitcoin's the only thing that satisfied this, but I just want to give you an example, right? No matter what advances there are in AI, there's not going to be 21 million Bitcoins. And so they can't change the laws of math, however smart they are. So that's why if you just had a dabble. So my point being, whatever else you're doing because of the speakers this week, just keep in mind, this is an extra reason if you own just a little parcel of real estate somewhere, that would be enough in this future world where you know, every brain surgery costs a dollar, but how do I get my dollar if I can't get a job as a worker? Well, if you own just, you know, an acre of land somewhere, that might pay you the equivalent in our currency of $100,000 a month in terms of what you could buy with it. Okay, so that's the way this stuff would all uh, come together. Okay, that's my time. Thanks, everybody. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com. <laughs>